Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, caregivers. I know I say this every week. I have the perfect guest for you. I have been doing this show for six and a half years, almost seven years when this episode comes out. And today we are talking to Dr. Logan DeBose. He put a pause on his training in his residency to do something that all of us caregivers have needed and wanted for years, and that is to connect us to support. And I know you're going to love his story, so let's just dive right into it and welcome. I'm just going to call him Logan so I don't trip over his last name. (laughs) Thanks for joining me, Logan. Oh, it's great, great to be on. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me. Um, Fading Memories podcast as well. Um, Just a great initiative, a great podcast. So I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about my journey so far and the resource matching tool that uh, our team, the Olera team, um, Olera is the name of our, our group, we're creating to try and help exactly what you said, support families, connect them to aid programs, connect them to resources, care services, and try and help maybe demystify um, demystify some of the confusion that's out there in, in caregiving for someone with dementia or other disabilities. Well, considering most of us find out from a doctor, you're definitely on a needed track. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and you know why you decided to extend the, the timing of becoming a full-fledged doctor by taking a year off from your residency to work with it's Olera Care, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer that question. So uh, just for those who may not be familiar, it, it's a pretty long training process. You know, after you graduate high school, you go to undergraduate school um, and then you go to medical school. Those things take eight years um, together and then you go to residency. And that's where I completed a full year of residency. Um, it's a total of three years if you do internal medicine, which is the specialty I chose to do. Um, And so I finished that first year um, about three months ago, four months ago now, and I'm taking the last four months and and all the way up to a full 12 months off. And the reason I'm doing that is because I believe that um, projects like Olera.care, the website that we've created, the tool that we've created that I'd mentioned, um, will help the patients that I see um, once they leave the hospital find the support that they need. And so why... The last year um, kind of led my my first year of training in residency led to me taking this year off is because I noticed um, a strikingly large amount of patients when they're discharged from the hospital are struggling to figure out what to do next, are struggling to find their pharmacies, they're struggling to find care services such as home care or home health care nursing, wound care, um, struggling to get the medical equipment um, that they might need, such as walkers, canes, or even um, more advanced things like a Hoyer lift, for example, for transfers or wheelchairs. Um, So I noticed from my year of practicing medicine and residency, um, so many times when a patient would leave the hospital um, that I didn't have anything to hand them per se. I didn't have a a guidebook. This is how you take care of, of somebody with dementia after you discharge them from the hospital, many patients with dementia, unfortunately, end up in the hospital due to various reasons, such as falling or not eating or drinking. And so this happened a lot. And I had the opportunity to be um, to receive a grant from the National Institute on Aging that allowed me to fit this kind of into my residency program a year to to work on this project. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. I've got uh, quite a few more months, about eight more months um, and then I'll be returned to the hospital. And the goal is to return to the hospital with a tool that I feel confident um, to hand my patients when they discharge from the hospital and say, here, you know, you can start here. Here's some resources and support services in your area. Um, just read about it here or work with your family members to look into the website. Um, and hopefully you can get a little bit of help. So that's the that's the background, Jennifer. <laughs> and do you have a family, any family history of dementia? I do. Uh, My grandpa has vascular dementia. So Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia might be a little bit different um, in terms of how you describe them clinically. 
So my grandpa had strokes and these strokes led to brain death over time. Um, he had four strokes and each time a little part of his brain wasn't working the same way it was before the strokes. And so he has difficulties with mobility, short-term memory. Um, and he now isn't able to, um, take his medicines on his own. He needs somebody to help remind him to do so and, and to help, uh, get food for him, meals and such. Um, so my mother is the primary caregiver of my grandpa. Um, and my grandma also helps as well, um, on and off as she's able. Um, so I've had that experience. It was about 2018, whenever he had his, his, um, strokes before blood thinners were on board and were helping to avoid more strokes. So, um, I can speak about it on a personal level too. And, um, they're currently navigating this, a lot of the things you all are probably navigating, trying to understand long-term care policies, think about assisted living versus if you should be at home care, how much can the family contribute with working schedules? It's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a big, big endeavor to take care of somebody. Um, so I'm happy to share personal and clinical experiences. Um, whatever you'd like to hear about Ms. Jennifer. Definitely. So I think a lot of caregivers, well, most of us are kind of thrust into this. We make adjustments, put into practice some, some sy systems and we mm. move on. And before we know it, we're up to our eyeballs in taking care of, you know, parents or grandparents, maybe you're a sandwich generation caregiver, you're still working your career. It's, you know, then you add in all of this, trying to figure out where to get the assistance, the medical equipment, the in, in home help. It's a lot. It's like wrangling a whole circus of cats. <laughs> it is. It is. And um, I think, you know, I'm not sure everybody's story is a little different, but from what I've found in research, um, speaking with families, uh, is that some of the first places they go, of course, is a primary care doctor, but even more importantly, often is uh, friends, families, churches, communities like this, podcasts like this, um, the internet as well. Though it's not often the number one thing that people will uh, report, they'll usually say, at least the research shows, that they speak to friends, family, word of mouth. Um, but the internet is a huge portion of what we have available to to us to spread the word on what we call and what you were describing, we call the elder care ecosystem, a huge network of healthcare, financial, legal, um, and then private and public aid programs and services. It's a mess. <laughs> and everybody's, it's a fragmented system that's not streamlined by any means. So we chose to focus on what we could, which was using the internet as best we can to demystify this as best we can. And it's an iterative process. So we're actually working with, with families right now to use our website and tell us how we can improve it. Um, we know it's not in a final form now. And so over this year, while I'm off, I'm, I'm working with families. If anyone's interested, I can give you a link, Jennifer, on how we can connect and we can get on a Zoom call and we can go through the website and you can tell me what you think and then you can use it and, and tell me if it's helpful. That's cool. So tell us, well, let's, well, kind of talk us through the website. It'll be sure. linked in the show notes so people can see it, but where did you guys start? Where are you at now? Where are you hoping to be by the end of your year before you have to go back to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the project won't end um, when I go back to the hospital. I've got a large team and uh, we actually just applied for another grant we're hoping to receive. Um, so we're hoping that this website as it stands right now will be something that will last a long time and will continue to improve. But let's walk through the website where you could expect logging on. It is a it's it's a it's a care planning tool. We like to think of it. It's a it's a way that you can input what you're looking for. Just six or seven questions we we ask about what is the activity level of the person that you're taking care of? Um, do they have memory loss or not? What are some of their basic activities of daily living they need help with, such as cooking, bathing, cleaning, um, transfers? So we ask a few questions and collect some information. And then we try to save a little bit of time um, searching all around the Internet and Google or Bing <laughs> and, and hitting dead ends or long wordy articles. We, we try to save you a little time. We take those questions and we organize our database, which is a vetted, curated 
service providers and aid pro information on aid programs and information on different uh, medical goods or products, essentials or senior care. We try to take our database and organize it by what we've found to be the most prominent uh, challenges that people face, such as paying for senior care. How do we pay for this? What are the professionals that can help me? What are the aid programs that exist in my area? Um, who can I talk to if I'm lost? You know, that's one big one. You know, if you senior living, finding a safe arrangement, either at home or in an assisted living facility, an independent living facility, memory care at times. Who do I talk to? What do I need to do? What are the discounts, benefits, waivers available to me to help me afford this? These are the sorts of um um, these are the sorts of information that you can find on the website. And we try to organize it personalized for you. And we call this the um, caregiver support dashboard. Um, and so you can log on, make an account, answer some questions and review your dashboard at this current state. That's where we're at. And uh, would love to anybody who's interested in trying it out um, would love to hear what you think um, because we're actively engineering every day. We're thinking, how can we make this better? How can we make this more useful? Um, for people. And so are you working with a bunch of this? So there must, you must have a bunch of tech tech bros, for lack of a better term, <laughs> working on this. Oh, absolutely. So I am the um, the chief operating officer of, of Olera.care, which is the uh, small business that owns the website and collaborates with the National Institute on Aging. I bring the clinical experience. I also have a uh, master's of business administration and MBA as well. And so that helps me with some of the operational and administrative tasks, but that's one small part. We have our CEO, which is a biomedical engineer. Um, he's a PhD from Texas A&M or a candidate right now. He's about to receive his. Um, and so he's an engineer. And then we also work with an excellent um, team named X5. It's a contracting company who helps work, who we work with for some of the designing and user experience um, design work on the website and building some parts of the website. Um, so we do have a large team of tech, tech people, tech bros, um, <laughs> and they are excellent. And we hope one of the things that we want to prioritize the most is we know a lot of websites are very wordy and long and hard to navigate and use a lot of jargon words that people aren't used to hearing or understanding. So we're focusing on trying to keep things simple and streamlined as much as possible. Um, and the best way we can do that is, again, um, hearing from you guys and hearing from anybody who wants to tell us, you know, what they liked and didn't like. And we can we'll we'll, we'll respond by talking to the tech bros and changing things up. Now, so when you put in a, you answer the questions and say you're looking for an assisted living or memory care community, obviously that then is local or regional, not, you know, but the whole website is obviously national. Is yeah, that, is that a challenge making that happen? Cause there are lots of resources out there, but man, they're just scattered into the wind. Oh goodness. Yeah. Let me tell you, we've had to be very creative, um, pulling data on care services on the local state and federal level as well as aid programs and discounts benefits waivers on the local state and federal level very complicated again we call this the elder care ecosystem we we use the word mapping the elder care ecosystem so it is very complex some of the some of the challenges we faced is that states vary on the pricing um, of home care versus assisted living versus memory care, they vary on the um, available state uh, support and waivers for housing for the seniors. Um, so it basically requires a very large database and a sophisticated, not necessarily complicated, but more of a sophisticated tagging structure, making sure that we can keep track of what is an aid program, what state is it applicable in, when was the last time we updated it, um, and how do we link that into our dashboard, our caregiver support dashboard to make it useful? Um, because you I don't know if you've ever read uh, details on assisted living waiver policy in California, but it's probably not a light reading task. Um, <laughs> no, it's probably above my pay grade. I don't think I have that much legalese uh, knowledge to 
to decipher it. Well, it's, it's crazy. The, you know, even an insurance contract, for example, or a long-term care policy, if you've ever sat down, you know, with a cup of coffee in the morning, I'm going to read my long-term care policy. <laughs> you know, no one does that. And because it's hard to read these things. And so whatever we can do to map this elder care ecosystem, present it in a way that people can use it. Um, that's what we're interested in doing more than anything. Mm -hmm. So though you've gotten a grant, hopefully a second one from the National Institute of Aging. Are they looking at what you're doing as a way of maybe, I'm not sure how to word this. My thought process is people didn't live as long as they're living now. We seem to have more chronic, difficult diseases to deal with than we did, you know, 40, 50 years ago starting to age myself again. <laughs> so I think that's why the care and the support is just everywhere, but nowhere. So is the National Institute of Aging kind of looking at what you're doing as maybe something that they can then also integrate into what they're doing, hopefully, like so we can get all these resources coordinated? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent, excellent point of discussion. Um, the National Institute on Aging is particularly interested, for example, in their 2023 summit on dementia care and care services, one of the major research gaps, priorities for research and development projects like ours was to uh, organize the on the local, federal and state level, all of this ecosystem that we're talking about. So to answer your question directly, that's one of the uh, a, a well-organized database of services is very much a priority for the National Institute on Aging. I um, mean, they're looking for small businesses that are interested in doing that, um, like ours. And then the other thing, you know, it's great if we have all this information, um, but how are we presenting it? Um, are we presenting it in a way that's adoptable? Um, and so that's one thing that we are obsessed with is if we show this to an individual um, across the socioeconomic spectrum, aka how much you make, if somebody is a rich person or a poor person, can they use it? If we show this to people of different racial or ethnic groups, can they use it? Is it culturally relevant? Um, and are we successful in taking complicated information, such as all the care services, all of the aid programs, and, and translating that into adoptable information? that actually leads to behavioral change. For example, picking up your prescriptions or knowing what an assisted living home costs and how you might, or at least who you would talk to first, if you feel like you would need that in order to finance it. So these sorts of questions, we were interested in having people use the website for a little while and see if they're better at um, kind of addressing these real world challenges that we will all face um, at some point one way or another. When you're doing the search for like a memory care residence or assisted living residence, do you give them a list of things they should ask and places they should check to make sure the, the, the facility is um, appropriate or, you know, doesn't have issues because most of my listeners should know <laughs> That the memory care residents my mom moved to, I got I I picked them because they gave me a good feeling, and they said they'd keep, let her keep her dog. Oh, so mm -hmm. I did not do any legal research. I didn't even look for Google reviews. <laughs> I didn't do any of the stuff you're supposed to do. Thankfully, it worked out just fine. My gut did not lie to me. But it even now, it's like I know the things I'm supposed to ask, but I'm not sure exactly where to find some of the like state licensing information. I mean, I'm sure I could find it if I Googled it enough, but is that information that's included? Oh, good. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. 
I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. It is, it is. And so in our um, provider listings, we call them. So a provider is a general term for an assisted living home, for example, or a home care agency, or even a, a provider of a support group. You know, you provide a support group too. You can create a listing for that group. But if you look at one of these listings, we have a next step section on um, them. And also, and so that next step will detail what would be the questions you would ask. Um, one of the, you know, and just, you know, kind of getting into that, some of the top questions that you that people are interested in is how close is it? What is the staff to patient ratio or staff to client ratio? What are the medical um, needs that I have? You have to ask yourself questions. So, you know, what are those that I have? Um, do I need somebody to come in and help me dress or do I need somebody to give me medications? Those are two different types of services, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then can that facility meet those needs? And typically a nursing assessment goes on somewhere in between there where the assisted living facility will have a nursing assessment of some sort to kind of match those needs up. But we do try to very, very clearly detail those questions because it's very hard if it's your first time doing this to understand, you know, first off, what is an assisted living facility? How is that different than independent living? We have articles on that and videos and such. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that that... I kind of got off your question, I think, but <laughs> no, you answered it. Um, oh, and then so I know it's like sometimes you, it's easy to go deeper into the weeds, but right. it's helpful because my father passed away while he was on hospice. We had in home care, which in early 2017 was over $700 a day. You know, a lot of people think I'll just do that because keeping them at home is better, cheaper, blah, 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 than, you know, moving them to a memory care community, et cetera. That is not necessarily true, despite the high cost of a memory care. Oh, and sure. my mom got, my mom and the dog moved from, her sister would stay with her in mom's home. My mom would end up with my sister's house. And my sister had school aged children. So that was a busy household. And my sister's in-laws were there. And then my house, I ran my photography studio. I had, that was attached to my house. So you know, I was working, I just turned 50, my daughter had just moved out, but it was really obvious that my mom did not have respect for me as an adult running the household. And I just knew, thankfully, I figured this out before it was too late, that her moving in with me was a very, very bad idea. I knew it just was not going to work. So I'm trying to find the assisted or the memory care community. While my dad's on hospice, and it's just, oh my gosh. You know, I didn't even think of those questions. I just went and took tours and hey, the place seemed nice. The people seemed nice. They weren't too salesy. It was crazy. And then they said, oh, we could talk about her keeping the dog. I was like, oh, here's money. <laughs> take take my money. <laughs> yeah. Finding an assisted living facility. That we're, I mean, one of the biggest things is cost. Like you mentioned, it's just so costly. And what we find nine times out of 10 individuals who will call our web uh, our website hotline. We have a hotline where individuals who are looking for some sort of care, um, you can call us or and we call um, back sometimes and, and we'll ask the questions, you know, how much how much do you think assisted living is? Right. And it, people are surprised when they hear it's anywhere from three thousand dollars a month is a low range, you know to eight thousand nine thousand dollars a month um it's very expensive so many folks we refer to actually um elder law attorneys believe it or not and financial experts because what what ends up happening is we have to find ways to um spend down to assets and i don't want to get into the weeds here but it's a very complicated legal process of finding a way to afford 
the basic care that you need. Um, and it often involves elder law attorneys and financial planners um, to use your resources. Yep. I've talked to more attorneys than doctors on this show. What does that tell you? <laughs> yeah, you know it then. You know it. It's Medicaid spend down is um, a highly utilized uh, tool right now to make sure that uh, nursing home care can be paid for through public pu public in uh, public insurance, Medicaid. If you listen to any of the past episodes that talk about Medicare or Medicaid, call it Medi-Cal in this state, which gets hmm. really confusing, <laughs> is um, there's ways you can plan ahead for future expenditures that you would want paid through Medi-Cal or Medicaid, maybe Medicare. So there's, there's a lot of options. It's just like, you know, you just have to have a PhD in all this stuff. You and do? Was oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I almost tried to forget my next question. So you guys are developing this fantastic website that caregivers can use. What is the thought process for getting medical providers on board so that when, I mean, there's, I've had stories of primary care physicians not telling somebody they've got Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia because there's nothing that can be done. So, eh, you know, I'm, I don't agree with that. I understand it. So that's not a judgment. And it's also one more administrative thing to do. And I know doctors are kind of overburdened with that. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to get the medical providers on board so that the website's getting used on both sides? You know, it's getting recommended when it needs to be recommended. Yeah. That's, I'm, assu thanks for I'm that. assuming you guys have uh, thought that one out. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Um, you know, real simply, um, we have little cards that have QR codes. Um, these are little things you can scan with your phone and it takes you right to the website. And we are very close to starting to drop them off at primary care offices, give them our, our um, details on what our program on our on our website, what it is, what it does. And the way that the primary care doctor could use this, and and I actually, you know, during my years so far of training, I've I've seen multiple opportunities, which is why I wanted to create this, of where I could hand out these cards, and you could log onto the website, and when you walk out of the clinic office, you're not in silence. <laughs> you have some guidance, a little bit of guidance. For example, what are the pharmacies near me? What are the home care agencies near me? What are the financial or legal providers that specialize in elder care are familiar with working with seniors and their families through these difficult, unique situations? Which ones are recommended? I mean, we do a thorough vetting process of, of who we recommend. And so there's a certain level of quality control that that I would like my patients to have. Um, it's kind of like, like a digital Rolodex in a way you can think of that I'd like to be able to hand out to patients. And I think primary care doctors as we continue to map out the elder care ecosystem in various areas around the country, we'll find it a useful tool, something that they can hand somebody like a little card or just refer them to the website. Um, so uh, I'm sold. I'm the first doctor, I guess, <laughs> sold, you know, we're, we're getting close to where I feel comfortable handing it to my patients, um, you know, at mass at a mass scale, but we are slowly mapping different areas of the country. So we'll start there with the primary care doctors there. I mean, you're on the wrong coast for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll be there soon. Not not too long. Oh, well, hey, you know, California's only got 40 million people, and Alzheimer's is the number three cause of death in the state. Sometimes it's number two. COVID kind of kicked it down to three, which mm -hmm. normally I think nationwide it's five or six. So, you know, yay, California. We gotta we gotta get there and be number two. <laughs> Boy. Yeah, well, we'll be we're we're definitely looking at the largest cities in the country and mapping those first. Um, I'd be surprised if we don't already have a fair amount of mapping done in California. Um, but that will be on our list very soon. And I'll let you know when it's live with the doctors around California too. That'd be awesome. I'm assuming that it's even more challenging with rural areas that have less resources and less support. It is very much so. Um, what I run into all the time is, um, when we do some marketing campaigns in rural areas, we'll find individuals who are looking for home care. Um, somebody maybe just to come out once, kind of a one-time thing, or maybe on a more frequent basis. And the home care agencies don't service their area. Or the ones that do, there's only a few. 
And the ones that do, um, two things happen. Either the home care agencies don't have staff or there's a long waiting list or something, um, or the individual can't afford the home care because home care now can be anywhere from $20 an hour to 45 to 65. I've seen 65. Yeesh. Um, so rural areas are absolutely a challenge. One way we're trying to get creative um, that we think that the internet doesn't do a good job of right now is listing um, local community volunteer programs and adult daycare programs. Churches often have programs and these awesome efforts don't often get much real estate on the internet. Um, so we're thinking that maybe that can be one approach to helping this, this we call it, you know, it's kind of like a desert out in some of these, you know, a desert, a care desert, you know, it's, it's, there's not enough service area that a lot of home care agencies cover. And so people get, there's gaps in the, across the country. So that's one thing we're looking into, but I agree. It's a very challenging, um, very challenging in multiple fronts. And you're trying to uh, corral all the services and resources in this very large country and then just give parse it back out to the people who need it. We just went to um, Glacier National Park. Now, we live an hour north of Sacramento, so we're in a semi-rural area. Yeah. I'm not sure there's too many rural areas in California, but... We would drive through places in like Idaho and parts of Montana, and it's like I would ask, you know, the uh, they they fixed it so you don't have to say "hey" in front of S I R I anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say so the computer wakes up. But I would say, ask it, how many people live in this state? And it's like, are you kidding me? Two million people live in this entire state. There's mm -hmm. forty million in California. It's like. People move to some of those places to have space and freedom and not be harassed by traffic and crazy neighbors and all that. But then you're the flip side of the coin is there's a whole lot less to do because we're an hour away from our doctor. And trust me, when you don't feel good, that stinks. Yeah, that's tough. I think another thing that we didn't mention when we talk about rural areas, something that COVID um, forced us to get used to were virtual, remote not only doctor's visits and telehealth, but other services too. And one of the ones that I'm particularly excited to be exploring right now is tele-social work. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with a social worker before. These are, or case manager is another um, counterpart. These individuals coordinate care. Um, and that's in general, um, they from doctor's appointments to helping you understand what your medicines are, to helping you understand what assisted living is and kind of ongoing long-term support. How can we deliver tele-remote um, professional care coordination to these rural areas? Because then dedicated time can be truly spent to looking into those what family can help you, for example, meet your basic needs? What are your basic needs? What family could help you if there's not any care services around? What churches programs are around? These social workers will have time and dedicated time to call around every number they can find um, versus that's hard for a lot of people to do that sort of, you know, in-depth research. It's very, very time consuming and requires a certain level of skill. Um, so anyways, yeah, rural areas, I think tele- um, or virtual support groups, social workers, doctors. That's that's something that I'm extremely... Anytime I hear an effort or an idea about that, I'm trying to push it forward as much as I can, including our own. Yeah, I've done, a, I've done let me think, two or three. Let's say I've done two telephone appointments. And I think one, like, it wasn't Zoom, but like a, a video doctor's appointment. And considering they can't see you or touch you the results have been pretty good you know it's it's difficult to diagnose something you can't see and touch but yeah and know. there's there's limitations of course there's limitations um so i think it's a matter of what can we do well over the phone what can we do well over the internet over a laptop or a screen and what do you need to come in for? And I think we're all still figuring that out as a group, you know, as a medical community, as a patient community, as a physician patient 
community. We're figuring out, you know, and I think 10 years from now, telehealth, hopefully, will be very good at what it does and will be good at referring to in-person visits um, when that's needed as well. Okay, well, 10 years, I'll be officially Medicare age. So that'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. I can't remember if it's Social Security. Well, one of them is 67 and a half. Mm. Whatever, but close enough. So, so the website is Alara.care. You got it, Alara. Oh. Mm -hmm. And what? So after your after the this journey, mm -hmm. you're going to go back and finish two years of residency. You got it. I'll go back. Um, I'll finish up my training, um, and my plan is to to work as a hospitalist. So that is the person who works in the hospital um, to discharge the patients and to treat them while they're there. And so I think that that discharging the patient and being on the um, being that decision maker really helps me kind of understand the lacking the gaps that exist. When do I feel unsafe? What would make me feel safer for this to discharge this patient? That expertise is what Olera um, hopefully I'll get to contribute and continue to contribute um, as a clinician. I'll be able to suggest these are the things that we need to include in the website, include in our technology in order to fill these gaps I see when I'm trying to discharge patients. Like they need home care. That's one of the biggest ones. Patients need home care and we need to make it affordable, available, um, accessible. Um, so that's one example. And so that's what I'll do. I'll go back two years and then after that work as a hospitalist. Um, Olera as a company will persist on. Um, I'm just one of many individuals involved in the project. So, um, you know, thanks to all of them. If you're, if any of them are listening, um, they'll carry on the project um, into the future. So we'll see where it goes. And we're excited to share it with everybody. I'll send you some links after this as well. That'll be terrific. Well, I appreciate this. Like I said at the start, I've been doing this show for six and a half years, closer to seven when it comes out. And I, I've talked to one doctor. I don't think I've, I'm not sure I've talked to half a dozen doctors and I've never talked to one addressing the problem that I would, I would venture to say a hundred percent of families deal with when they get a, any form of dementia diagnosis. So I applaud you. I applaud Alara. I'm excited because it's something, as you know, we need desperately. And for you to take time out from, you know, the, the short term time it takes to become a doctor is, <laughs> is impressive. And it, it makes me hopeful that, you know, things are, I mean, I know I've seen in the six and a half years, I've seen a lot of shifts and this is a big one. So I, I thank you for that. Well, uh, again, thank you uh, for having us on here and for doing the great work. Caregivers are the backbone of the infrastructure for long-term care support right now in America. So thank everybody listening. Thank you for your work. Us physicians appreciate you and all you sacrifice and the care you provide your family and your friends. We're, we're going to try and catch up as fast as we can to support you. And that, that this is one of those efforts. Um, so we appreciate all the exposure. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.